Good morning. I'm here this morning with a special edition of On Deck, and we're talking about a very serious subject, not only in Mashpee, in Massachusetts, and actually in the whole world. I have a repeat guest here, Joan Peters Gilmartin, and I have a new friend and a new guest, Joanne Ravicchio. Thank I you. pronounced it correctly. Sadly, both of them have lost sons to overdoses, but happily they have decided to deal with their loss by becoming very involved and making sure, would you say, making sure that both sons' deaths were not for nothing, huh? Not a, just a statistic. Not just a statistic, understandable. Uh, so. We have a very special day coming up at the end of August, Joan, yes. and could you tell us a little bit about it because that's really what we want our audience to hear about today. Right. Well, August 31st is International Overdose Awareness Day, and for the first time the state of Massachusetts is going to be doing a statewide event in the city of Boston as our site. At the Parkman Bandstand on the Boston Commons, we permitted with the city of Boston underway and uh, it's going to take place from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the evening, uh, ending with a candlelight vigil. Uh, we have a speaker lineup. We have a keynote speaker, Joanne Peterson, and uh, who's done a tremendous amount of work in the state supporting families. Well, you just families. looked at Joanne and said, Joanne Peterson, and you know not, who is Joanne Peterson? Well, Peterson. everybody knows Joanne yeah. Peterson. I don't. Who, Tell who, me about Who her. works in, well. Um, Actually, I think it was down. She's been doing this for 11 years. 11 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. um, actually, her son had problems with drugs, and, uh, and she became very, very, very um, uh, how, what active, active, what active in say? her community yeah. okay. uh, um, about getting services and help for individuals. And she actually started a group called Learn to Cope. Oh. And she's done a, a remarkable job with that. And, and she's and learned all over the country with that as well. National yeah. recognition and, nation mm -hmm. and na statewide chapters now. So it's been a, a very huge program in lending support to families. Wonderful. Because I think the major issue is that nobody should feel like they have to go through this alone. And most of the support comes from other families going through the same thing that may be a little bit further ahead or learn some coping strategies or been further educated in the disease to understand and be able to help others. Uh, and the major part of that is removing the shame and stigma. Well, you use that expression, both of you, shame and stigma. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, first of all, our children had stigma to begin with. They had their own stigma. They didn't want to be using. It's something that happened. And, and, and unfortunately, um, opioids is such a, a, a very hard drug to try to to get rehabilitated. Right. And they do go through tremendous pain. Their body goes through um, withdrawal that no one will ever understand unless you have um, actually done opioids. And um, my son used to stay home a lot because he did. He did. He would never put. He would never think of putting a needle to his arm. In his last four months of life, he ended up. Um, dying of a heroin overdose, you know? So um, they look at themselves sometimes and, and they're upset with what they've done. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. my son mm -hmm. was injured in an accident. He had a motorcycle accident, a Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they brought him over to the Mass General Hospital where he didn't need to have surgery. And at that point is where his addiction started when they had given him OxyContin. And um, so that started a 10-year battle with addiction and many, many, many bouts in rehab. Um, I, I have a question about that. They gave him this medication. Did they give him too many pills? Or how long does it take to become addicted to these pills? Because I think people think, you know, I, I can handle this. I'm in pain. I want it to be over. And from what I'm hearing, it doesn't sound like, it sounds like a very easy very easy. Uh, I've worked in family medicine for 30 years, and uh, I was certainly a, an individual as well as community witness in the healthcare community of the drive of pharmaceutical company, one in particular, Purdue Pharma, who marketed OxyContin, who in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, made a very uh, 
concerted approach through Wall Street advertising to figure out how to market their product, which was OxyContin, primarily previously used only for uh, hospice terminal life care mm -hmm. uh, as a pain management drug to expand the market. Mm -hmm. And the primary market was to expand it for pain in the primary care service. And so there was a real concerted effort for very, they hired a very young sales force, uh, attractive young people to come to doctor's offices and provide free lunches um, and promote this drug as a non-addictive drug. And that we were sort of being chastised not only by pharmaceutical company but our own medical societies uh, telling us that we were under treating pain and that it was our job to treat pain 100 percent and here we had a whole new drug class that we should be using uh, more frequently and not to be concerned about people oh. becoming addicted. Now clearly in your end of life patient you're not concerned about the issue of addiction but you know when you're starting to use these very potent pain killers in really young people for sports related industry uh, in, industry excuse me injuries for in sports related injuries uh, for surgeries like appendicitis or dental surgery right. uh, you know a fractured bone where clearly we've used other things like ibuprofen or Tylenol like a few Advil right <laughs> or Can I ask you a question? yeah mm -hmm. did you um, go on that trip to Washington yes okay yeah now do you remember what happened there yeah now and you I have should, to tell our I will audience tell about you. the I'm trip tell to you what happened. Washington. Well, we were there. FDA um, had actually just um, approved OxyContin for 11-year-olds. Yeah. And it, it, we were all dumbfounded. We could not believe that with this problem with opioids, how could they actually direct it towards a younger age group. That was in 2015, 16. And the parents that were there were absolutely shocked because there we were trying to promote passage of not only the CARE Act but funding for the CARE Act which is the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Emergency Resources. And um, the, there's no doubt that the FDA has been complicit in what's gone on along with our med state medical associations and primarily Big Pharma which is why now there's big lawsuits mm -hmm. planned. Uh, many states, I think there's now 24 states involved in the class action lawsuit That's against wonderful. Purdue Pharma. And okay. there's major protests planned in the near future by many state nonprofit organizations and families. I, I have to say that, that it, it makes me unable to speak, which doesn't happen to me very often. <laughs> but 11 year olds, I mean, that's just year frightening old, no. and horrible, and horrible to think I that don't the pharmacy. I don't really want to actually tell you what we said. We said FDA, why are you killing our kids today? We chanted well, that through the streets. Did, and he never got a chance to get up there and talk about it because we wouldn't allow him as mothers that have lost our children. And that following spring at the uh, National um, Addiction um, Abuse Heroin Summit in Atlanta, Georgia, where the national people are there, the researchers, the investigators, the uh, you know public health and uh, policymakers in Washington, when the FDA chair walked onto the stage, it was m drop mic silence from the audience, who mm -hmm. many were people in long-term recovery, early recovery, and families of loss. And so that says something about how we have to sort of look at the bigger picture of how we ended up where we were. I mean, I finally got to the point, and I think I was probably on the fifth time of going through another detox recovery time with my son, we had a 13 year battle, um, where I sat across from that drug rep on a Friday lunch because he brought lunch every Friday to our office and he sat there again making his argument that this was a non-addictive drug and I was sort of getting into an argument with him about it and then finally I called him in a not so very nice way a liar <laughs> and I asked him to leave the office and not come back and everybody kind of looked at me and I sort of went to my boss afterwards and apologized, uh -huh. thinking I had been completely inappropriate. And he goes, no, you were right on target. He supported me. And that drug rep never came back to our office. So there was a concerted effort by Big Pharma to push inappropriately. And people can become addicted very quickly. It can happen in as short as a week. It can. To susceptible individuals. And that's, <clears throat> that's scary because somebody could, a motorcycle accident, you want to have right. some kind of pain. Right. I actually that. spent 
three or four days there with him. I never left his side. And as a mother watching your child in pain and crying and, and needing more medication, you automatically want them to do what they of can to, to take that pain away, not knowing that it would be a 10-year battle. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, actually burying your child. You well, know? and there's nothing worse than that. Mm -hmm. But as your therapy, kind of, you both have become very involved. Mm -hmm. And this event on Boston Common is happening for the first time, such a large gathering. Right. There's been many uh, individual town um, vigils over the years. We did it in Hyannis uh, three or four years in a row uh, in the month of October, usually connected with our purple flag right, relay. Right, the purple flags that everybody saw exactly. around the rotary. Exactly, and Nash. also our, yeah. our purple flag run across yeah. uh, the Cape. Uh, the Saturday evening was the purple flag vigil mm -hmm. uh, in Hyannis. But this year we really decided to come together all these nonprofit organizations across the state and get our numbers together because I think it's more impactful as we That's come right. together with our numbers. And we need to make not only the public but more important our congressional leaders understand we are a constituency of consequence. We're paying attention to how you vote, mm -hmm. where you stand on this issue, where you're willing to uh, devote funding because as uh, Senator Ed Markey often says, uh, you can pass all the bills you want, but if you don't fund them, they're just hallucinations. All about money. Isn't and it? frequently that is the issue. But, you know, pre-election, a uh, candidate will be supporting something and um, vote for a bill or help pass a bill, but then there's no funding attached to it. So in the end, it's just a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're currently, on. many of our organizations are working on uh, call programs, letter writing campaigns to our congressional leaders to say, please fund these bills that you're passing because if you don't fund them, they don't get help to where it's needed at the local level. Um, the House did pass funding, uh, passed the bill and supported funding. Now it's before the Senate and of course the Senate is kind of dragging their feet. So now there's another major push campaign to let's get these bills passed and funded fully so money can get to the states to do the programs because basically the federal government is looking to the states to take care of their own and there's not necessarily that's not unreasonable but there's got to be money mm -hmm. absolutely. absolutely absolutely you know I was at um, the Parkman school when we assembled I happened to be in Florida when that shooting happened and and there were vigils all over the country but yeah. this one particular one was of course filled with thousands and thousands, yeah. and it was a memorable event. I know this event is going to be a memorable event. That's what we're hoping. It's going to be amazing, yeah. amazing. Tell us about how people can participate. Well, Heroin is Killing My Town is a Billerica-based nonprofit that has done what many of our different nonprofit groups has done is to try to help navigate people into recovery. Uh, because that's a very difficult thing to access um, for families in crisis. Uh, we do a lot of uh, policy advocacy and uh, community education programs. And so um, this group is coming together as a, as a bunch of smaller nonprofit groups to put on this program to raise awareness. And let's not just let all these losses, not only in our state but across our nation and across the world, be forgotten. They're not just numbers, they're people's, they're somebody's someone, That's which right. is the major song that Daphne Willis will be singing at, at our event at the end uh, when we have the vigil. She's coming up from Nashville, Tennessee to perform oh, for us as oh. our uh, one of our major event uh, performers. We're and going that, is that a song she wrote? Yes. Because you know, it could be anybody's That's child. Right. Anybody can say, listen to it on mother, YouTube. Your, father, yeah. your brother, your sister, your uncle. You could be a rich could person, be you could be a middle yes. income, you could be a long-income. Anybody. Okay. This well, not too long ago, a billionaire lost his daughter. Yeah. This oh, disease okay. knows no dem demographic right. uh, limit. It's across all demographic. And maybe that's why this is suddenly in the public conscious where, you know, when we went through the last major heroin epidemic of the 70s and 80s, it was a limited in our... Uh, minority populations, and so it really didn't get the attention it deserved, and righteously so. Some of those people are angry that it was ignored until it became, you know, uh, a Caucasian problem, uh, middle-class suburbia right. problem, and right. rightfully so. 
Um, but now we need to, as a country, come to, to, together and say, how are we going to stop this loss? When you lose 64,000 Americans in a year, you have reached an epidemic that is beyond scale. We haven't seen a public health crisis like this since the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s. So our country really hasn't mm -hmm. seen a public health crisis like this in 30, 40 years. Well, now we're going to have to come together, just like we did back at the early AIDS epidemic, where there was tremendous stigma and shame associated with that and people dying. We have to come together again and commit resources to halt the loss of life. Because if people think we can lose a half a million Americans in a five-year period like we have, in the 22 to 44-year-old age group, that's not only a national security risk, it's a public health crisis, it's a, an economic financial disaster, because that is the age group of wage earners who should be putting tax money into our total budget that supports the baby boomers getting ready to retire. So right. if somebody thinks it doesn't affect them, it affects everybody. Well, that's an excellent it point. It affects that's everybody. That's an excellent point. Yeah, I never even thought of it that way. Yeah. All I knew is that 80% of the country is affected by addiction yeah. one way or another. And when will the other 20% get affected by it? They could be people that have to find a way, and it might be you might be the victim to find it. And possibly, because it's underreported, possibly these are people also that live with a certain amount of stigma and shame, so they don't seek care. We also mm -hmm. know that there are 23 million people currently actively suffering with substance use disorders. There are another 22 million living in recovery, long-term recovery, doing amazing things so people have. can get their life back. Right. But of those 23 million suffering, only 10% of them get access to care or get any meaningful care. How is that right in our healthcare system where we spend billions of dollars every year to suffer this amount of loss? 64,000 Americans per year since 2016. Um, is it, that's more lives than were lost during the entire Vietnam conflict. It is now more lives per year than from gun loss from gun deaths and motor vehicle accidents. This right. is huge. The number one cause of death. Number one. And, and for the first time, the United States is seeing a decline in life expectancy because of this epidemic. Mm, and, and people need to understand the numbers. It's huge. Do you know that we are now up to over 36,000 people have been lost? I'm sure the number is a lot larger already this year in the country. Well, you said in your city of Somerville. We lost seven so far. Since, since January, January 1st. we've lost seven. And I gotta tell you, last time when you were on the show, I sat here and I said, I gotta do something about this. We ha And you know, la la la, I went off to my regular life because I'm not affected by it, mm -hmm. but I am affected Everybody's by it. Everybody's affected I? by it. And it's time that everybody stands up and does what they can. So we want everybody at that vigil yes. on yes. August 31st, Boston Common, 6 to 9, by August 10th. Yes. Important. Yes. That's the uh, deadline date for families to submit a photograph of their lost family member that will be broadcast on the screens beside the main stage during the event. Mm. We are going to have media coverage there. Um, there's uh, going to be a number of very significant speakers and performers. Matt Ganim, who is a person in long-term recovery and an excellent poet. He's yeah. actually traveled to many of the schools in our state um, doing poetry that he writes that's just yeah. Really, you know, as, Powerful. A, as a teacher, I used to teach elementary school. I'm thinking the kids have to be educated very at a very very young age. They do, Don't and that's they? the problem, though. When we get into like, I am from Somerville, and I try to work with the city in different ways. But I'm just a grassroots group. Um, I'm a part of some of all the companies to say. May I add that Mike Duggan and um, uh, Matt Gammon were a part of our group, and of course they branched out to. Um, where they needed to be, right. to be needed, uh -huh. you know, and, um, and actually that bandstand that we're going to be at is where um, when Matt had no place to live, that's where he was. So this is going to be an event for him mm -hmm. Very special. Um, because now look at me eight years later, nine years later, how good I'm doing and recovery is possible. And this is what we have to talk more about. We yeah. know we, we've lost so many people, but then there's still hope because there's 22 million in recovery. Right, and, and that's our 
sort of end point, I think, too, is that we don't want other families to have to go what we've gone through. But people should know that right here, even in Mashpee on Tuesday night at Corpus Christi Church, there is support for family. Um, Jeannie Flynn runs a group. Oh. Uh, I don't, nice. at Corpus, Corpus Christi, Christi Church, Church. At, here in Mashpee on Tuesday evenings. Um, and Swift. so there's support here in our uh, own neighborhood. Um, there's many online groups, mm -hmm. uh, team sharing, which has, I think, 500 families now involved yeah, across the street. Yeah, so there's lots of, and, and those groups tend to also have men involved because I find that dads, fathers, grandfathers have a very t hard time coming out Right. physically sometimes or being exposed the emotional piece too, yes I would and imagine. so for them sometimes the online groups are a place to go I certainly I my coverage area is more the lower Cape now since I left Mashpee after 30 years and um, we have a population down the lower Cape that is far removed from where the localized center of services right. are for the Cape so that's why the open doorway of Cape Cod which is way down in Northeast Ham uh, sort of initiated itself because there was such a need to provide some services mm -hmm. for the lower Cape area but I find that advertising and the communication is the problem we need to find out what's available in your area for services it's great that we have Facebook because there are lots of online pro um, groups Right. And um, right. any time that you're up and you're feeling poorly and it, you, um, all you have on your mind is your loss, there's always someone on. Someone to talk to. to be able to talk to. Oh, that's a great thing for everybody to know, I think. You know, I want to wrap it up. Sure. Um, because it's so emotional. <laughs> I want to get a lot more information from you afterwards. But uh, August 31st, you both are going to be there. Yes. Absolutely. And sadly, you're both going to have pictures up. Yes. Up there. And it's on a number of social calendars. Matter of fact, the Barnstable Regional Substance Abuse Commission, our own Barnstable County uh, Public Health Commission, will be, it'll be on their calendar. And that's also another excellent resource for people living on the Cape uh, dealing with problems as RSAC. They have uh, resources and community education calendars where people can go for free and get the information they need. It's great. And we here at Mashpee TV will do the best that we can to promote August 31st date. And thank you. And thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to get working on this. Thank you.